Okay, you're set. Yeah. Okay, so now the last talk of uh, today by, is by Lauren Jewell. Okay, thank you very much. So, hello everybody. So, I, I was asked. Uh, thank you very much for the for the invitation. It's really nice to to be here. I finally made it uh, made it here as you as you saw. So, um, I was asked to talk about models and uh, model uh, models and observations of stellar magnetism. So this is really broad. So I, I decided to limit myself to some aspects only of the large scale magnetic fields in cool stars. So cool stars meaning stars which have a convective envelope and a radiative interior. Uh, and uh, mostly focusing on the most recent uh, results that are quite uh, interesting uh, to, to, my, uh, to my view. Uh, in, in particular, this is an illustration that you see uh, behind of a recently discovered magnetic field inside the core of, red, of the three red giant stars. A red giant is a star which has evolved a little bit more than the sun. The sun it will become a red giant after it, it finishes uh, uh, its uh, hydrogen in the core. And it's, uh, it's uh, quite an impressive result that uh, magnetic field were measured inside the core of these uh, stars. I will come back to it a little bit uh, later. So sorry if uh, maybe, um, You've seen already a lot of this before. I will be quick. Uh, the, of course, when we talk about the magnetic star, we want to talk about the sun. We know that the sun is a magnetic star. We have uh, this manifestation of magnetic fields which pop up at the surface of our star and uh, which are known for a century now to be magnetic uh, regions. Uh, they are bipolar um, structures which emerge uh, uh, in a particular way during time at the surface of the star. They are really monsters. You can compare them with the size of the Earth here. Uh, and with a particular, st particular structure, really, both of the magnetic field and of the flow, uh, with an umbra at the, at the center where you have strong, very strong vertical fields here, of, or three, four uh, kilogos, something like this, and a penumbra around where you have a very uh, particular structure of the flow. And what you see here is the granulation, the, the, the manifestation of the convection at the surface of the sun. Uh, so this is, uh, of course, one of the, the, the biggest mystery, maybe, I would say, of, uh, of uh, solar and stellar magnetism and people trying to understand what's going on in these uh, objects, uh, is that in such a turbulent uh, uh, object, you still have such a very ordered uh, uh, systematics. You see that when you look at in time at the evolution of sunspot at the surface of the, of the sun here, uh, you see that there is a cycle uh, with a reversal every uh, 11 years for the sunspot to peak every 11 years. Uh, and we know that uh, there is some kind of appearance of the sunspots first at mid latitudes and at the beginning of the, of the cycle, and then closer and closer to the equator and then a reversal and, it start, and the cycle starts again. Of course, the, the, the magnetic field will reverse every 11 years and to have a full magnetic cycle, you then need to wait 22 years. Uh, so this is one of the of the, the maybe biggest thing we would like to to try to to reproduce with the particular models, uh, with dynamo models, of course, because uh, we think that everything is going is happening inside the star. So now we need to go a little bit inside to understand what's going on and what are the, the structures of the flows, uh, which are responsible for creating this magnetic field uh, at the surface. So this is the uh, solar interior. You have a cut here with the radiative zone uh, up to 0.7, more or less, uh, solar radius. Then the convection zone, where the, the, the transport needs to be done by the convective motions, because radiation is not effective anymore at transporting the heat. Uh, and uh, then this is what I was uh, telling you before. You see the granulation here. And uh, for the sun, what, what we is quite uh, um, uh, powerful is that we have an idea of what are the structures of the flow inside the sun. So this is thanks to helioseismology and asteroseismology now is providing us similar constraints, but for other stars. And uh, so the, the red giant I was uh, showing you at the beginning, it's through asteroseismology that uh, these magnetic fields were discovered. So we know that, uh, so thanks to the acoustic waves which interfere to produce modes and gravity waves which propagate inside the radiative uh, interior. So in, for the sun, it's mostly the acoustic modes that we detect. And, and thanks to it, with a, a great success of helioseismology was to uh, infer the profile of the rotation in the sun, uh, rapid uh, rotation at the equator and slow rotation at the poles. 
And when you go into the radiative zone, there is a very flat rotation profile, a very rigid profile. And this is also one of the uh, uh, mysteries uh, of how you, you produce this flat profile for the rotation and how uh, you constrain this uh, transition from uh, solid body rotation to differential rotation in a very, very small uh, zone here, which is called the tachocline. So this is also uh, something which is uh, quite uh, uh, a question that people uh, want to, to understand. Um, there is uh, also quite a lot of activity for the observers to understand uh, the uh, poloidal flows, which are to detect the poloidal flows in the sun. So we know there, that there is a marginal circulation, a large scale flow, uh, which is in, the, in this direction, in, in, the, in the plane of the bar here. Uh, but we don't know exactly uh, the uh, structure of this flow very deep down because it's very difficult to measure. This marginal flow is very weak compared to the rotational effects on the waves. And, uh, but uh, now helioseismology, so I indicate you here a, a recent uh, um, paper where now we, we start to infer this marginal, pro, pro, marginal flow profile up to 0.8, maybe 0.85 uh, solar radius. So it starts to be pretty good. So this was for the sun, but of course, uh, other stars are also here. And uh, we have a lot of stars which, are also, which also possess all the ingredients to produce magnetic fields. And we know that a lot of stars are magnetic, actually. And we are going to concentrate here on uh, cool stars, I was, as, uh, as I was telling you. So this is a typical diagram that astrophysicists like. This is a nature diagram. You have the temperature of the star on the x-axis and the luminosity of the star on the y-axis. And what you see here is the dots are stars. Uh, and uh, so, and the, the, I, I hope you see that you have some uh, gray and black lines here. They, sh they show uh, what is the path followed by the stars uh, during their evolution within this, uh, this uh, 2D uh, diagram. Okay? Uh, so in this uh, region here, in this blue region, uh, the uh, structure of the star is quite um, uh, is, is, uh, so th this is a region, this blue region here is where the stars are, uh, are uh, mostly uh, fully convective, okay? So they, they possess a convection zone which uh, takes the whole domain really of the star with uh, either a very, very small uh, radiative core or no radiative core at all. The, the whole heat is transported by convection. And on the main sequence, on the main sequence is where the star uh, uh, burned their hydrogen into helium. So this is where they spend most of their time. Uh, the, it's mostly the low mass stars which are going to be fully convective. And then when you start to be a little bit more massive, like the sun, you're going to have a, a non-negligible radiative core and a convective envelope, okay, like the sun. And then when you're even more massive, you're going to have uh, uh, the opposite uh, structure a convective core and a radiative envelope. I'm not going to talk too much about this. So we know that uh, there, there is going to be a, a large um, possibility to study uh, uh, the, uh, the magnetic field on, on all these kinds of stars, of cool stars, with the same kind of structure as the sun. Uh, recently, and uh, well, actually it's been a while, that the rotation of stars have been uh, measured. So this is the period of rotation of stars as a function of mass. And uh, so this is uh, just to show you that uh, the, uh, the cyan points were the points which were added by the Kepler satellites. So before the Kepler satellite, you had just the black dots. And now that the Kepler satellite came uh, measuring uh, the, the period of the stars through photometry, we added all these points and we now have a very nice view of uh, how the, uh, the cool stars, uh, again here, uh, low mass rotate, okay? So the sun is here you see that they can rotate pretty fast compared to the sun. And all the ingredients are here, rotation, convection, they're going to be pretty good at producing magnetic fields. And indeed, you observe fields in stars. So this is an, uh, the, uh, an observational diagram produced by uh, spectro spectropolarimetric surveys on stars which are more or less similar to the sun or um, less massive. So again, cool stars. What you have here on this diagram is the mass and the rotation period, okay? And uh, these symbols here represent the characteristic of the magnetic fields in these stars, okay? So it's always complicated to, to explain this diagram uh, because you, you have a lot of information in fact here. The size of the symbol tells you the strength of the magnetic field, okay? 
uh, the shape of the symbol tells you how complex the magnetic topology is. So if you have a very round structure, it's a dipole. If you have a very complex star shape uh, symbol here, it's a multipolar field. Okay, we can say this. Uh, in fact, it's for, just for the poloidal field. And so I, I go to the last thing, which is the color. The color tells you how poloidal or toroidal is the field. So if you're very red, you're very poloidal. If you're very blue, you're very toroidal. Okay, so we, we can see a lot of uh, trends here from this diagram. First uh, one is that if you go to low mass, it seems that uh, these low mass stars, which are fully convective, as we said, they tend to have very, very strong poloidal fields you know, and very, very strong. This is uh, the, the size of the symbol here. I, I remind you, tells you the, um, the strength of the field. The sun is up there. Okay, so the sun is ridiculous compared to these stars. Uh, if we look now at, uh, at uh, stars which are more or less solar-like, the, the same mass, okay? If you increase the rotation period, so if you, uh, uh, the rotation rate, so if you decrease the rotation period, you go more and more toroidal, okay? This is also one of the, of the trend that we can see on this diagram. Um, what uh, one striking uh, feature also is the fact that at the same location of this diagram, you can uh, find stars which uh, have very, very different characteristic of the, their magnetic field, either a very strong uh, poloidal field here or a very weak multipolar field. And this is also something uh, which, um, uh, which can be a uh, question, which is uh, seen not just for uh, these uh, cool stars, but also for uh, uh, stars which are on the pre-main sequence, young stars. Okay, so I think I said everything which is, uh, which is here. So th this gives us already a lot of constraints, right, for the models. This is just a snapshot uh, in time of the magnetic field of cool stars, okay, of, of, a serve, of, of a sample of cool stars. Now we would want maybe to know if these stars have cycles also to, to follow them in time and see what happens. So it's a bit tricky. Uh, you, you see the, the, um, for the sun, we have an 11 year cycle. Uh, if you want to have an idea of the magnetic reversals on, on these uh, other stars, we will need to follow them with spectrophotometry on tens, on tens of years, typically it's the time scale. It's tricky because spectrophotometry has been here for uh, just a little bit more than 10 years, in fact, for, for, these, uh, for, for these surveys. So, uh, in fact, to, to, have a, to have longer um, uh, uh, surveys, to have uh, uh, longer time scales, we, we try to uh, look at indirect measurements, which, are the, which is the chromospheric activity of stars. For chromospheric activity is all the eruptive, act, uh, eruptive activity, all which is what is re related to the presence of a magnetic field. And we think usually that this is a pretty good proxy for the, the presence of the magnetic field. Uh, so the chromospheric activity was followed uh, in the, at the, the Mount Wilson for, uh, for several decades, actually, in the 70s, 80s. And uh, for uh, hundreds of stars which, are, which were uh, solar-like. And um, a trend came up, which was that so, so a, a large number of stars showed the cycle, cyclic activity for the, for the chromospheric activity. Uh, and uh, people came up with the idea that the cycle period was increasing with the rotation period. So the faster you rotate, the shorter your cycle period will be, your magnetic cycle period, if we go directly to say that uh, magnetic activity and chromospheric activity are related directly. Okay, so, so this is quite uh, impressive and uh, it may be a bit more complicated as a story if you think of different branches or whatever, but mainly this is the observational trend that the faster you rotate, the shorter the cycle period. Now we, have a, we start to have a direct measurements of the magnetic field reversal thanks to spectroperimetry. And uh, this uh, trend is not really, um, uh, uh, modified by the, 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 the direct measurements. They are still in agreement with this uh, typical trend. Okay, so now I go a little bit more into the theory, what we can do to understand what's uh, all these, uh, these uh, observations, okay? So of course, we're going to look at the induction equation because this is what governs the evolution of the magnetic field here and the uh, interaction with the velocity field, okay? Which is uh, going to be the main reason uh, why we produce the magnetic field we see at the surface of these stars. 
Okay, so here you see the, the uh, induction equation split in two different terms. Uh, and here I schem schematically uh, tell you a bit about the different ingredients that we can think of if we want to build a simple model, okay? So if, the, if we think of sources of magnetic field, the differential rotation will be a perfect source of magnetic field. A poloidal field will be sheared into a toroidal field by the omega effect. The alpha effect will do the opposite. So from or can do also uh, the same thing, going from a poloidal to a toroidal field or from a toroidal to a poloidal, helical motions, uh, the, the small scale helical motion working together to produce a large scale poloidal field. Okay, in the sun, a, a pretty popular uh, idea also for the uh, reproduction of the poloidal field is the backcock Layton mechanism. It's, it was uh, put forward in the 60s by Backcock and, and Layton. Uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, you have your bipolar uh, uh, sunspots which emerge at the surface of the sun uh, in, during time, okay? Uh, and they are slightly tilted with respect to the east-west direction. The decay of these active regions and the fact that the, the, this positive polarity here will cancel with the negative polarity at the, in the other hemisphere uh, will uh, produce a net flux which will be negative here and which will be able to reverse the previous polar field. Okay, so this is a, a viable also mechanism to um, reproduce your poloidal field from the toroidal field. Okay. Uh, and then you have transport, of course, the magnetic fields, the, the large scale flows, meridional circulation, for example, the pumping at the, at the base of the convection zone uh, by the fact that you have a, a stable layer below and the transport from the base of the convection zone to the surface through magnetic buoyancy, for example. And then you can build uh, different kinds of models, uh, either mean field models where you have to put, you, you put a lot of uh, simplifying assumptions in your, uh, in your model to, uh, to you, you'll parameterize most of these, uh, uh, of these effects. And uh, more importantly, you're going to parameterize your turbulence in these models. Or you can, you can uh, build a full MHD model solving the induction equation coupled with the other MHD equations, okay? And then it will be more complex, but also more self-consistent. Uh, and then you can use maybe a little combination of both. Okay, so this is just, I'd skip this, just to show you all these various ingredients together in the sun uh, playing uh, the, the role it, it wants to do, okay, to produce the, the dynamo uh, loop that we would like to, uh, to study. Okay, so first we start with a very simple 2D models, okay? It's kinematic, so there's no back reaction of the um, magnetic field on the uh, velocity field. You just have your poloidal equation and your toroidal equation with a backcock Clayton source term. And you can nicely reproduce a cyclic magnetic field with the features that you, that you want. For example, the, uh, this is just a northern hemisphere here for B5, northern hemisphere for BR. This is at the base of the convection zone. You recover, for example, the equivalent migration of the sunspot from the mean latitudes to the equator, okay? In these models, uh, you use a meridional circulation here, which is one cell per hemisphere, for example. And what you see is that the cycle period, the magnetic cycle period will be very, very uh, strongly related to the amplitude of the meridional circulation, okay? This is really just a, a pure uh, advective path followed by the magnetic field the advection by your, by your uh, meridional circulation. So the, the faster your uh, meridional circulation, the shorter your cycle period. Okay, so we, we can uh, wonder if this model is applicable to other stars, of course. Um, the problem is that we have no idea of the meridional circulation on other stars, but we have 3D models. 3D models will produce self-consistently the meridional circulations, okay? So in fact, this is a combination of models. You can rely on 3D models to tell you uh, how the meridional circulation scales with the rotation rate of, the, of your model. Uh, and then try to implement this in your, in your simple 2D model. Okay, so what uh, the, these, these are 3D hydro models where you see the convective motions here, you see the differential rotation, you see the meridional circulation self-consistently produced and uh, prescription can, can come up from there where the amplitude of the meridional flow will be proportional to one over omega, more or less, okay? So the faster you rotate here, the slower the meridional circulation. 
Uh, and in fact, you directly see it's a problem because when you reintroduce uh, this uh, scaling in the, the 2D model to apply it to stars, the faster you rotate, the slower your meridional circulation, and then the slower your magnetic field advection will be, and then the larger the cycle period will be, opposite to what the observations tell us, okay? Other effects may help a bit, like pumping, like changing uh, the emergent circulation profile. You see that it's not at all a 1D uh, cell here, a uh, uh, one cell uh, per, uh, per hemisphere. But you can also easily argue that it's too simple. These models are too simple. They are mean field. It's there are too many assumptions here. So, okay, I, I would agree with this. And then we can go to more realistic 3D models. So now uh, 3D models in the, in the solar stellar community, they start to produce uh, quite routinely a large scale magnetic fields uh, reversing uh, in a very uh, regular way. Uh, and this is a typical uh, example of uh, such a simulation where here the full MHD equations are solved you uh, produce a large scale magnetic field, you produce self-consistently your different rotation, your meridional flows, your convection is here uh, to produce your uh, cyclic uh, magnetic field here. But what you see here that we are at one rotation rate and if we slow down the, uh, the rotation, then the cycle period uh, decreases. Okay, so again, opposite to what the observations tell us. And in fact, uh, this is uh, taken from one of the uh, of these uh, of these uh, papers, the Strugarek et al. Uh, 2017, with one particular code, Yolag. Uh, but uh, now it's been uh, it's been uh, this uh, similar trend has been found in a lot of uh, of other uh, codes and uh, similar simulations. So they all converge toward the same kind of trend that is uh, opposite, in fact, to the observations. Okay. So it might seem a bit uh, uh, unsatisfactory. So we may wonder what's going on in these 3D models. So there are, these, these are a bit more uh, recent findings, I would say. Um, we can wonder what is still missing from the 3D models of these uh, solar-like stars. So there, there is one uh, thing which is uh, also apparent in all the, the 3D simulations is that they, they always produce convective velocities which are too strong compared to what is observed in the sun. Okay, so this is, a, this is a scene here, too strong, mostly at a large scales. This is a spectrum of the convective energy as a function of the spherical degree here. So this is large, the large scales. And this is the observations. Uh, they are a bit uh, 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 criticized, these observations, and maybe a little bit higher. In fact, this, uh, this line here, but you see that compared to uh, simulations, all the simulations are much higher in terms of, uh, of uh, convective energy, okay? So it's pretty bad because if you have uh, strong convective uh, velocities, you will be at the rotation rate of the sun at, at, the at the luminosity of the sun, you will have a Rossby number which might be too high and then you switch your um, regime of differential rotation. It's known that if you go to too high Rossby numbers, the rotation uh, will be anti-solar. So the, the sun would produce an anti-solar differential rotation for the models, okay? So we need to find a way to suppress a bit uh, these convective velocities. And recently, a way to do this was found to, uh, to appear in a very, very, very uh, highly resolved simulation uh, where the, uh, the, uh, the large scale uh, velocity is suppressed by the presence of a small scale dynamo. So they have a small scale dynamo, in fact, which is extremely active, which is high enough to suppress the flows at, at uh, large scales. And uh, in this case, you see, this is a low, middle, high for the resolution. You produce uh, the right direction, uh, a fast equator and a slow pole the right regime for the differential rotation. I don't think it's the end of the story because uh, you see the, this, this is the, this case here is, the, um, is the, the purple line here. So we're still pretty high compared to the, the observations. Uh, and uh, these simulations are not necessarily completely converged also. And the last thing is that uh, they, in these numerical simulations, uh, they rely a lot of, on the purely numerical dissipation. And this is known to be a bit dangerous possibly. So we need to check what are the effects of the dissipation. Of course, in the 3D models I showed you uh, until now, there's just a convection, a convective shell. 
there's no, uh, we, we don't take into account at all the presence of a radiative interior or of an atmosphere above, okay, and not even of a photosphere. Uh, this might be a problem because, uh, for example, these 3D models, they don't produce spots. And spots are, thing to, are thought to be possibly crucial for the, uh, for the operation of a dynamo, for the Baco Clayton model, for example, which is uh, uh, supported by several observations. Spots are absolutely necessary, but the, the models do, do not produce them. Um, of course, the radiative interior might do a lot also uh, as uh, like, uh, uh, like uh, building very strong to toroidal fields, uh, uh, helping for the convective penetration, pumping the field. And this is also necessary to be taken into account and not so much, not so much uh, uh, being done for the moment. Okay, so there's still uh, some, some progress to do. So I, I have no idea, maybe uh, it's, it's already, uh, ah, yes, okay, all right. I can still go on a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Until three fifteen, right? For the okay. All right. So, so this is a. So I was telling you about the cycles up to now. Okay. So, and I told you before that we also have snapshots of the magnetic morphology of cool stars, and that I think is quite interesting also for people doing planetary dynamos because it's um, it's uh, studies which have been made quite a lot in the in the planetary dynamo community. The um, the how the magnetic field morphology changes as we change the rotation of this of the, the star of the planet, for example, or the Rossby number. Okay, so uh, in fact, the influence of the Rossby number was put forward uh, in in the context of a planetary dynamo already. If you look at this uh, diagram, this is a representative of what was shown before. The dipolarity uh, is from zero to one. You have a pure dipole here and here a co complex uh, field multipolar. And this is as a function of Rossby, okay? So if you rotate fast enough, you have a small Rossby number, you will have a very uh, large ordering role of the Coriolis force, which will build um, a dipolar solution where the shear is almost uh, zero and where the shear has almost no effect or the differential rotation has no effect on the dynamo. And when you increase your Rossby number, then inertia becomes important and then you, your shear will be able to develop and then you switch into another kind of a dynamo mode, possibly an alpha omega dynamo, which is more prone to produce multipolar solutions, okay? So this was the picture and what is interesting also is, is that small Rossby number, you can actually produce both. And this is a bit reminiscent of the bistability uh, region for the stars where you had, where you were exactly at the same location for the diagram, but with very different pure dipole or pure multipolar field. Uh, this was uh, looked at in uh, the planetary dynamo uh, context. So in boost in S simulation, where you don't have any effect of the density stratification, okay? But then uh, in, this, uh, in these uh, simulations a bit later, they started to uh, look at the effect of the, the stratification, the ratio of the, uh, the density at the inner boundary the, divided by the, uh, the density at the outer boundary. And then what happens if you look here, if you increase n rho, you increase uh, the uh, stratification in density, and then everything lies down uh, on the multipolar branch. So you lose completely the dipoles. It's a problem because stars are very strongly uh, stratified in density and they do sh uh, show a lot of dipoles. So there should be a way to produce dipoles even in very strongly stratified uh, systems. Okay, so, so it, was, uh, it was studied uh, then uh, a bit more. And uh, recently with a, with a PhD student, we thought we would look again at this uh, at this uh, problem inspired by what was done in the, again, in the planetary uh, dynamo um, uh, community, where uh, we change a little bit the force balance and we start to have a Lorentz force, which can be quite strong compared to the other forces. So the, the Lorentz force now may play a bit of a role in the force balance, okay? And then what we did here, so to do that, we decided to have a PM of five, okay, which is not really representative of what happens in stars, but we wanted to place ourselves into this uh, regime. And we now have a density stratification uh, up to three, okay? And you see what happens here. Again, you have dipolarity as a function of Rossby, and you can reach dipoles 
for the strong stratification, the, the mild stratification, if you want, uh, you can reach dipoles up to a Rossby number of 0.4. So in fact, much higher than the 0.1 limit, which was, uh, which was um, suggested by this uh, previous diagram. So what happens exactly here is that we, we uh, I think it's uh, quite necessary to look at the force balance in these cases uh, in, the, in the same way as the first calculation in Boussinesque uh, by Menu et al. 2020 and more recently by Tassin in 2021. Uh, in fact, what you, what you see is that the ratio of inertia to Lorentz is now more critical than the ratio of inertia to Coriolis. And this is seen here on these uh, spectra. You see the, force balance, the, the various forces here, the spectra of the forces as a function of L. You have L peak here, which is the, the peak scale, the integral scale, the peak uh, for the, uh, the kinetic energy in the convection, okay? And uh, in the dipolar solution, what you see is that, so it, it's always uh, the geostrophic balance, which dominates here. And then you have your adgeostrophic term in gray, your Lorentz force in uh, red, and inertia is quite down below, okay? So you have a second order balance between buoyancy, Lorentz, and adgeostrophic term. But when you go to the multiple, the inertia has kicked, uh, kicked in, okay? It, it's gone uh, into uh, the play with the, the second order balance, okay? So this is our interpretation here of uh, what happens when we go from a dipole to a multiple. And actually it works pretty well when you look at, uh, so this, this is uh, just for the, this was uh, comparing inertia and uh, Lorentz. And we came up with uh, another kind of uh, proxy, which would be a good, uh, uh, a good way to compare with uh, observations, a kinematic to magnetic uh, energy ratio, where we have a distinction between the dipoles here and the multipoles where the, when this ratio is high enough. And actually we compare with a few observations of stars, which seems a bit promising. We do see also a transition to uh, multiples when this ratio starts to be important. So really magnetic fields can, can be important to consider the, the, in, in the force balance. And in fact, I wanted to show you this, which, which are new uh, results from spectropolarimetry. Spirou is a new instrument uh, looking at very cool stars. And they decided to uh, populate the diagram in the slow uh, rotators, okay? You remember maybe from the first diagram I showed you that there were no points at all in the slow rotators. And uh, so in fact, this will be in the high Rossby regime um, uh, region, okay? And uh, the, these very new results tend to show that strong dipole also exists in this region, okay? So it's, this is not yet uh, published. This is very new, slow uh, M dwarf, uh, slow uh, rotators. Uh, which uh, do seem to produce large scale fields also. And I think I remember that he was also, uh, uh, Jean-François Donatis, the lead of this, was also telling us that they had some magnetic cycles also in these stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so this was the, uh, the uh, originality compared to the, the Boussinus calculation, which were done before. We managed to get dipoles at, at stronger density contrast. Okay, um, now I want to move on to uh, the, the problem of angular momentum in stars, because this is also something which is uh, uh, quite interesting and on which people uh, work uh, a lot. Uh, so there are various problems. You can look at a lot of things for, uh, for the angular momentum and the interaction be in particular between magnetic fields and rotation and differential rotation. Uh, so for solar like stars, for, for example, there's a lot of work on, the, uh, on how you constrain the Taco Klein to be in a very thin region at the interface between the radiative zone and the convection zone. Uh, you can also wonder how you, uh, you produce a very rigid rotation inside this radiative zone. Uh, usually, uh, magnetic fields are uh, put forward as very good candidates to, to produce such uh, effects, okay? Um, of course, when you uh, have your uh, solar-like stars with a convective envelope, they will produce magnetized winds. And the magnetized winds, they will have the property to, uh, to slow down, to spin down your stars, okay? So the spin down of stars is also uh, um, studied quite a lot. And uh, I think uh, Trevis is going to uh, tell us a bit about the change, the possible change 
of uh, magnetized wind properties for all solar analogs because they see some kind of weird behavior of the angular momentum loss uh, due to this magnetized wind. Okay. I, I go quickly on this because I want to go into the contracting stars. Now, if you uh, forget about the, the main sequence where the stars are not doing so much, in fact, they are living their life. Um, during the pre-main sequence or the post-main sequence, so when they are very young or very or, or start to be old, they have uh, regions inside the star where, where you have contraction or expansion. Or in contraction and expansion will have the property to modify the rotation rate, of course. When you have a region in contraction, you will tend to rotate faster and the opposite for the expansion. Okay. So uh, again, for the, the pre-main sequence star, we don't really understand why these stars don't rotate faster because they contract a lot through gravitational uh, contraction and they should rotate much faster than what is observed. And now I go to the red giant uh, story uh, where uh, again, the same kind of thing happened. The core of these red giants is contracting and the envelope is uh, expanding. So naturally you should have a spin up of the core and a spin down of the envelope. But in fact, what is observed through asteroseismology uh, is that it's not so much the, the case. Okay, so I, I'll tell you uh, a bit more about this now. Uh, so this is what I was telling you, the core contracts, so sorry about the French here, this is uh, the uh, hydrogen burning shell, this is because now the, uh, the star has finished burning its hydrogen in the core, it burns in a shell just above here, but this is fully in, the, in a full radiative zone now, I'm going to concentrate mostly on, on the radiative zone now, and you still have the convective uh, envelope up there. So uh, this is the end of the main sequence, you start to contract your core and expand your envelope. Uh, this, is, this branch is called the subgiant branch, and then you go to the red giant branch. Okay, during this subgiant branch, uh, the uh, there is evidence through asteroseismology. So the, these stars are great because you manage to measure the uh, rotation rate in the core, because they have a peculiar uh, modes, uh, which are called mixed modes, which are uh, gravity modes in the core, and uh, which have uh, the a property of acoustic modes at, at the surface. So you can detect them and they probe the core, okay? You can detect them at the surface and probe the core. Uh, there is evidence at this stage of a solid body rotation, despite the contraction of the core and the expansion of the envelope, meaning that there is a, a very effective extraction of angular momentum from the core. Then uh, you start to uh, ascend the red giant branch. So at the end of the sub giant branch, uh, nothing really changes. You still have the same kind of contraction expansion. Uh, but here what happens is you start to see a spin up of the core and a spin down of the envelope with this characteristic um, uh, contrast, okay? And then again, you continue the ascension uh, uh, along the uh, red giant branch. And now the uh, contraction of the core continues, but the contraction of the core remains constant despite the, the, the uh, rotation rate of the core remains constant despite the contraction, okay? So it means that you have some way to redistribute angular momentum in these, uh, in these stars, okay? So people were quite excited about these, uh, these findings because they want to understand uh, theoretically what happens, how you uh, transport angular momentum in these stars, okay? So in the, typically what people do in, um, in stellar physics, they pr produce stellar evolution models, which are supposed to uh, reproduce the characteristic of the star, in particular the rotation rate of the star as, as it ages, okay? Um, and there is a number of assumptions in these models because they are only 1D, okay? So if they are only 1D, you need to, to make a lot of assumptions to, to say how, for example, the uh, turbulence will act to uh, produce this additional transport of angular momentum. So there are possibilities that you have hydro uh, instabilities. You can have shear flows and then hydrodynamical instabilities, okay? You may have also marinal circulation, which can, can be quite good at uh, redistributing angular momentum. But with pure hydro models, uh, people were never able to reproduce the, the, uh, the very efficient transport of angular momentum seen in the red giant. Then people started to think of uh, magnetic fields. Magnetic fields could also be very good at, uh, at uh, transporting angular momentum. And this is where, uh, in fact, in stellar evolution model, what people use is a prescription done by Sprite in uh, 2002, 
relying on the fact that you could have a radiative zone dynamo. Uh, and this radiative zone dynamo would work in such a way you would have a differential rotation, which would produce a strong toroidal field. This toroidal field will be unstable to a non axisymmetric instability, which is called a, a pinch type or a Taylor instability. And the Taylor instability would then uh, behave sufficiently well to be able to reproduce the poloidal field you, you started with. Okay, so this is what is a bit tricky because this uh, Taylor Sprite Dynamo is quite difficult to reproduce numerically. Actually, I'm not sure we know exactly if we, we have. Um, so I, I guess uh, Florentin, uh, Daniel, we'll, we'll talk about this uh, later in the, in the week. Uh, anyway, it's a bit still a bit debated, and anyway, it's not efficient uh, enough either to reproduce the observations. Okay, so even with the new uh, prescriptions which were done recently, you still cannot reproduce in the, at the same time the subgiants that you see here and the red giant that you see here. You need to use a different calibration parameter, whatever it means here. But what is uh, to be uh, seen here is that you are not able with the, even with the Taylor Sprite Dynamo process, which is still debated, um, the, both the subgiant and the red giant at the same time. So uh, maybe you can look again at the assumption of the hydro models. You can look at other MHD instabilities. Uh, we can wonder uh, what we can do, okay? So the, uh, the, the main, um, one of the main recent uh, uh, results I wanted to tell you about is an observational result through asteroseismology. People were able to detect magnetic fields in three red giants. So uh, reviving even more the possibility that is the uh, magnetic fields indeed, which produce this angular momentum, okay? Uh, so uh, I'll go quickly on this. I'm not an expert at all. So I just want to tell you how people manage to find these uh, magnetic fields and to constrain it very well, in fact, uh, up to having a, a typical field strength and even a morphology. Uh, so what you have, uh, so with uh, your um, asteroseismology, you will have your waves with the typical uh, wave numbers here. Um, with uh, an M equals zero and N L equals one, what rotation does is that it uh, lifts this degeneracy between the A M equals minus one and M equals plus, plus one, sorry, okay? Uh, with uh, a symmetry in this multiplet between M equals zero, M equals plus one, minus one, okay? And theoretically, it was shown that if you add a magnetic field, a large scale magnetic field in this, you can produce asymmetries in this multiplet, okay? So this is typically, theoretically, what you can produce, a positive asymmetry where you have a smaller uh, um, separation here compared to here or negative if you have the opposite, okay? And this is uh, the observation of one of the star which, were, which was um, uh, actually looked by eye uh, by uh, one of the postdoc uh, in Toulouse, he found uh, asymmetries in these uh, multiplets here that are pretty clear. Huh? I think everybody sees it. And uh, in fact, he, they managed to find it in three different stars uh, and um, managed from these asymmetries and from the global shift of the, uh, of the multiplet in, uh, in frequency to came up with a, a, a constraint on the field strength so you see it's pretty big for between 30 and 140 kilogos for the, this. Uh, so what they constrained is a radial field. You see here, it's only the radial field that you get. Uh, K of R is a kernel, which is very peaked at the location of the helium burning shell. So in fact, you measure only the magnetic field here in a very small region, but still you have, an, uh, you have um, this result that you have very strong fields and uh, that you can have asymmetry parameters. So this tells you a bit about the morphology being compatible with a dipole when you have the positive, uh, a positive value, an axial dipole or an equatorial dipole when you have a negative value. Okay, so th this, uh, this is uh, quite uh, important and tells you that uh, indeed maybe there is a magnetic field which is uh, at play here. Okay, so we did some uh, theoretical studies which uh, were related to this, uh, this problem, where we uh, wanted to mimic the contraction of, the, of the, uh, this radiative region of the, um, of the red giant. 
And we did this with magic and to mimic uh, the, uh, the uh, contraction, we decided to introduce uh, a forcing velocity, if you want, which is in the direction, uh, which is a radial in the direction of the, um, of the center of the star. Uh, and which will act everywhere and which is divergence free, okay? And this, is, uh, this appears everywhere as a forcing velocity. So you force some kind of uh, radial velocity directed towards the center. And you just want to see what happens to the differential rotation and what happens if you introduce a large scale magnetic field, okay? So what happens if you have a, just a hydro simulation that you produce indeed a differential rotation as expected with the with the core rotating faster than the envelope. Uh, but you can have different regime where you don't necessarily have just a radial differential rotation as here and as was thought before because it's a very strongly stratified the system here in, in terms of entropy now not anymore in terms of, uh, of the density. Uh, so you expect uh, to have a radial uh, differential rotation. And this is one of the assumptions of the hydro models I was telling you about. In fact, in a different uh, regime uh, where the meridional circulation can be quite strong at redistributing angular momentum, you may have a differential rotation, which is both in radius and latitude. Okay, so I jump quickly to the case where we introduce a magnetic field so this, is, this one is particularly interesting. This is a, the, a quadrupolar uh, field. So what we are interested in here uh, all the time is the steady states, okay? So we introduce a quadrupole. We have to wait a little bit before a steady state is reached. And this is what the steady state looks like. So this is again omega. You see that you have two regions where you have uh, one region where you have differential rotation here where the Lorentz force is not active at all. And another region where you connect the field lines connect the inner and outer boundary. And here you have more or less solid body rotation. And you see here that you, you have a shear, okay, in this region here, and you have a magnetic field. And what we saw is that uh, these two are good ingredients to produce what is called a magnetorotational instability. And we observe an, an axisymmetric magnetorotational instability in this case that you see it first developing in the region of strong latitudinal shear. So this, this latitudinal shear we found was necessary here because we have a very strong stable stratification. So it's a bit more tricky for a radial shear to produce an instability because you need to extract uh, energy from the radial shear by, the, by radial motions. But radial motions are really uh, limited by the presence of the stratification. So you see that the unstable modes are really along horizontal surfaces because you have no way to move in the radial direction because of gravity. Okay, and then we produce this, uh, we, we look at what happens for this uh, instability. And in fact, what happens is that slowly, slowly, you, you kill your, uh, your um, very constrained system that you had here, really related to the presence of a magnetic field and you let your uh, contraction spin up your core and uh, spin down your envelope, okay? So our argument here was to say that maybe this is a scenario to, uh, to explain what happened for the subgiant phase, where here you have mostly uh, solid body rotation or the differential rotation will be uh, very located in small region where you have these uh, closed field lines. And by, the instability, you kill your large scale magnetic field structure and you let your contraction spin up your core and spin down the envelope. So uh, this was a, a bit the idea here saying that this is uh, what the differential rotation looks like. At the beginning, it's, it's really forced to be small because of the large scale field which imposes this tension. And then when the, uh, the instability grows, you kill your large scale field structure and you let your contraction uh, spin up the, uh, the core, okay? Now we don't explain through here uh, the uh, red giant branch where you have a constant uh, rotation rate of the core while you still uh, contract, okay? And then possibly non axisymmetric instabilities would uh, show up and would do something, uh, Taylor instability or non axisymmetric uh, magnetorotational instability or something else. Okay, so I, I jump to the conclusions here. 
Um, I don't know if I really put everything. I just wanted to, to summarize quickly uh, what we know. I think it's quite nice. I don't know if it's nice, but uh, we, we see in the solar-like uh, stars, we start to see that more and more codes uh, the, tend to convert the, the, the global MHD models tend to converge towards uh, pretty nice solutions with large-scale fields, uh, reversals, and where you have systematics. Um, the problem maybe is that we're still quite far from what is supposed to happen in the in stars, and in particular, this new finding that small-scale dynamo might be a crucial uh, ingredient might be a problem because here it, it might be more difficult for the convergence of all the codes for the small-scale dynamo because then turbulence might be uh, more tricky to, to agree on. Okay, for the fully convective stars, we are still wondering about this Rossby number the, the uh, relevance of the Rossby number to distinguish between the, uh, the topologies. Okay, so maybe the internal structure could be an important ingredient as well. Uh, and the radiative zones are quite nice because you don't have so much turbulence to deal with, actually. It's not convection zone where you, you'll be always quite far from what you can reach. In radiative zone, the models can be quite close to the actual parameters of stars. So this is quite nice. Uh, and uh, it's now pretty exciting to see that, for example, for these red giant stars, we have, for the first time, a measurement of the rotation and of the magnetic field in the core of a star. And this is really new and uh, can potentially lead to a lot of theoretical studies associated to it. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Lauren. Do you have a question? Okay. Uh, all dynamo, numerical dynamo models, which you mentioned, they can explain properties of the large scale magnetic field. How, how about the explanation of sunspots uh, to explain uh, generation of the field of 3000 gauss? which is a much larger energy of this magnetic energy is much larger than turbine kinetic energy. And also how to explain how to is possible to reproduce strongly concentrated magnetic field of the size of supergranules, which is the size of sun force. Yeah, yeah. yeah a good question. So I didn't mention at all the all the studies which are done on flux emergence. There are a lot of things which are uh, done to try to understand how you can have a magnetic structures uh, rising from the base of the convection zone up to the surface to produce the sunspot you see. Maybe if this is the idea of the Parker, uh, the Parker idea that uh, all these things come from uh, the base of the convection zone. Um, usually you, you, it's, it's, it's tricky with these uh, global models. It's a bit tricky to do anything because you're going to anyway being quite concentrated inside the convection zone. You're quite far from the surface yet. And uh, the last step uh, going up to the surface it can be crucial because you have a huge density contrast. So indeed, the uh, magnetic structures that you manage to make uh, buoyant up to a certain point, they will expand dramatically when they go to the surface. And then using global models for this is probably not the best. Uh, so you, you have a lot of uh, local numerical models which are more suited, I think, for, for this. And uh, even it's almost also fascinating to see that uh, maybe it's not at all this paradigm that, that uh, the magnetic, uh, the buoyant structures are created at the base of a convection zone. Maybe you just reconcentrate locally your magnetic structures close to the surface. It seems to be the case in very strongly stratified uh, uh, simulations of Axel or Brandenburg, for example. So I think we still need to connect. Uh, this is a bit what I wanted to say also with the, uh, the fact that uh, the 3D models I talked about here were just uh, convective shells. Uh, we still need to connect with ha what happens above and what happens below. And for this, we probably need to couple models or to, to do something else. Having everything in one simulation will be too tricky. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Luron. Very nice talk. Um, I, I'm interested. You showed that um, you could basically save the dipole-dominated dynamos for cases with stronger stratification, when the magnetic field was stronger or the Lorentz force was stronger. 
how did you manage that? How did you make the Lorentz force stronger? Yeah, so it's it's not exactly clear. So we find that uh, indeed when you look at the ratio of inertia to Lorentz uh, and uh, you, you plot the dipolarity as a function of this proxy, you, you see that all density stratification, they more or less follow the same trend being first a dipole and then having the transition more or less at the same value of Fi to Fl, this inertia to Lorentz. Um, but uh, the fact that, uh, so my interpretation uh, for the, uh, the, the, more, the more strongly uh, stratified cases where you, you, can, you need to go to higher ROSB to have inertia which start to be comparable to Lorentz. So it seems that you need to force your system more. In fact, having a higher ROSB for us means have a, having a higher relay number. So we force convection more. And uh, we need to force convection more for inertia to be able to be comparable to Lorentz in this stratified system. So I'm not sure exactly why uh, compared to the less stratified cases. Uh, this is still uh, not clear <laughs> to me. So may maybe there is some kind of uh, separation in scale in the domain. Um, I'm not sure, but th this is indeed what we what we find. We find that the high ROSB regime with the dipole is uh, rich only for the strongly stratified uh, cases. In fact. Just a question about your um, observational diagram. How is it known whether the field is toroidal or poloidal, you had like toroidal dominated stars and poloidal dominated, how, how is that known on these yes, distant uh, stars? Because, you know, well, so what they do here is that they, um, they measure the, the Stokes uh, profile, so the polarization of uh, lights in the, um, so it's, it's mostly uh, in, in the different spectral lines as a function of the rotation of the star. So you will have a different signature where you have a toroidal field coming towards you. And then uh, as the star rotate, you see if you have a toroidal field, it will come towards you and then uh, in this direction. Azimuthal field, azimuthal field, yeah. You're talking also about this, right? Azimuthal compared to poloidal. Yeah, but on the sun, for example, the azimuthal field is completely hidden. Yeah, it's true. I mean, the yeah, this is indeed uh, in, in the, in stars, uh, in other stars, they uh, they manage to see very strong toroidal fields compared to uh, to uh, what we see in the sun, indeed. And uh, so this, so maybe Robert seems to, <laughs> to have a comment. But uh, yeah, to, to my understanding uh, is to to distinguish between these uh, these components is really uh, what are the signature in the Stokes V profile, uh, and this will, it will look differently if it's uh, azimuthal or uh, marginal field. But we would infer that the sun had no toroidal field through that. Yes. <laughs> but we think it's got a huge it's, toroidal it's, field. It's, it's, oh, but it, it, what, what you, they see is uh, is a uh, very large scale fields uh, in stars. So that you see only the large scale field. So if you look only at the large scale field of the sun, you see just the dipole. So the m is equal to zero azimuthal field has been measured on the sun since the 1970s. Most recently, we show it in the um, 2018 paper. It's, it's measured on the sun for sure. Exactly as she explained, it's based upon the Stokes V, and you can see papers by Tom Juval, um, Phil Scherer, there's a paper by me, it, it corresponds to flux emergence. We've got one last question from Daniel. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I was Wondering, you mentioned this uh, observational uh, uh, discrepancy between observations and simulations of the, um, the cycle period for dynamos. And uh, do, do you have any thoughts on what might resolve that discrepancy? Uh, do you well, think it could be this uh, small scale dynamo effect as with the, the magnitude of the velocities? I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, I, I think there are, there are now more and more uh, simulations addressing this. And now the, in some uh, simulation by Petri and by the group of, uh, of Axel, 
there are also st start to be some uh, subtleties in the trends. So it will uh, it starts to depend uh, on the on the regime of rotation you're looking at. Slow rotators will behave a bit differently uh, than fast rotators. So you you start to have some trends which are less contradictory to observations, I would say. But uh, in fact, discussing with uh, Jean-François Donati, who does spectroparametric uh, observations, he was telling me that he was not entirely sure that the relying on this chromospheric activity proxy was a really good idea. So maybe also um, uh, relying too much on, on this trend or this observational trend might not be uh, exactly what you need to do. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure about the role of the meridional circulation in setting the cycle period. In fact, it's uh, it, in in all the three D simulations where they produce uh, cyc uh, cyclic variations of the magnetic field, it's never related to the amplitude of the meridian also of flow, which is just a big mess and and evolving a lot in time and space. So, but, but yeah, I agree with you. Yes. Yeah, but uh, observations of the meridional flows we have only for the sun, so yeah. Right, sorry. So now we, we're gonna take the break and maybe uh, I see there's a lot more questions from the floor on this, so maybe that's